Hey, welcome. It is so good to have you with us today. My name is Michael. I have the honor of serving as a pastor here at Mountain West. In case we haven't met, and thank you again for being with us. I got to tell you, I love Christmas. And I think this year, more than any other, I have thought not just I love Christmas, I need Christmas. Anybody else feel like that? Like, man, I am glad it's time. I know some of you felt like that because some of you have been decorating since like July. You're like, okay, I cannot wait this year for Christmas. And, 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 and I think there's something inside of us that, that, that hope we feel the, 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 the life, the God with us, all of that that goes with what we celebrate it's Christmas, and man, I, I want to spend the next couple of weeks just reminding us about that, about hope, light, stepping in to the world, into darkness. We're going to talk about that today. Just before we get there, I want to, I want to let you know something. I mailed you a packet. So we have your address. You're part of Mountain West. And I mailed you a packet this last week. You should be getting it if you haven't already about our annual year-end offering. We call it our legacy Offering, And so we started several years ago. Uh, we had some different names along the way, but last year we just decided, hey, let's just call this our legacy offering. It's, it's making an investment, right? We, we always say it like this. It's over and above your tithe and offering, right? It's, it's not a budgeted type of thing. It's an investment into the future so that, so that people's lives can be changed, so that when they look back, they're incredibly thankful for Mountain West. And, and, and so you should be getting more information about that. You can find it on the website. But here's what we do with that offering. We give it all away. It's not for budgeted items. We've never spent it on bills or personnel. Uh, it goes to support our benevolence ministry, which let me tell you, this year, you guys have been absolutely unbelievably generous, not only what you gave last year, but continued to give this year so that we can love on and bless and help people who are struggling, benevolence and outreach. We give to missions and special projects that, that we just say, okay, you know, hey, whatever comes in, we're just gonna invest it and we're gonna let people know that God loves them. The reason I, I, I wanna bring it up, I wanna remind you, I wanna challenge you and encourage you to pray about what you can give. But, but, but there's two big items this year that I want you to pray about giving towards. Our missionary in Haiti, her name is Elise Diaz, a lot of you know her. Um, I was just asking her the last time she was here in the U.S., you know, what, what could we bless you with? Like, if you, if you just had a dream, and she said, here's what I would really like. She, said, she runs a clinic, and she also does a lot of work outside of the clinic and traveling. She said, I would love to have two hospital quality ultrasound machines. One I could keep at the clinic, one I could take with me when I travel. So, so we've been looking these up. They're about $15,000 a piece. I know that's huge, but some of you, you might be blessed this year and you say, you know what? I want to do that. I want to invest in one of those. I want to purchase one of those for Elise. Uh, the second thing is, for several years, we've supported a, a Vietnamese couple as they've gotten trained and been through uh, school and investing in them because God had called them to be church planners back in their uh, nation. Uh, so, so they have moved. Uh, we helped them get back to Vietnam. They have settled in Ho Chi Minh City. They found a place to begin to start in January. And so I've been just talking to them this past week and was asking them about it. They found a little place they can live and they can open up to teach English and to begin to have Bible study. It's the way they want to reach and serve their community. $600 a month, the U.S. Uh, is what that costs. And, uh, and so I just thought, didn't make any promises to them, but I thought, what if? What, what if we could support them in that? What, what, if we could, what if we could cover their first year of rent? How incredible would that be? $7,200. Maybe somebody listening would say, you know what, I want to do that. Or maybe you want to invest in a month or, or just find a way or, or maybe any of the other things that we talk about in that packet. And, and I know, I mean, you may go, oh my gosh, you're going to talk about offering the rest of the service. Yes, no, I'm just kidding, not the rest of the service. But, but it's important. It's important because God has called us to be generous. And so I'm asking at this time of year, whatever you can do, as generous as you can be, would you pray about giving a gift back and investing it in the kingdom of God? And I believe that we're going to see the legacy of Mountain West has in people's lives that one day, who knows? You know, there used to be a song years ago, but it was, it was this whole idea of people saying thank you 
to you in heaven for what you did and things that you don't even know what God has done with your investment lives that were changed. That's our legacy offering. You can give online. You can go on the website. They're mailing you an envelope. You can send it in and that. But thank you for praying about that. Okay, as I said when I started, I need Christmas. And I have loved, I have loved driving around this year more than ever, seeing people put up decorations, seeing the lights. I'm, I'm, I'm not a Scrooge when it comes to all of that. As a matter of fact, the older I get, I think, you know what, when I see the decorations, it even drives me to the thought, God, thank you for Christmas. It's, it's not so much about whether I like the tree or like the decorations. I mean, granted, if you're just judging people's houses, sometimes it's a little tacky, right? Yeah, we, we have little kids in our home, so Christmas looks like little kids this year. It's not the classy Christmas with all of that, but it's wonderful because you start thinking, God, thank you so much for this time of year, for what it means. So as, as we get started in this, I, what is what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about light in the darkness. In the Gospel of John, he talks about the Christmas story. And he does it a little differently than any of the other Gospels. We'll get there. But, but here's what the Bible says. And I think this is what we all need, what we're celebrating. Matthew chapter 1, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And I don't know about you, but I'm saying, God, remind me that you're with me. Remind me that you are here. See, we hear and we say, Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. And, and, and we believe that. But sometimes, boy, it sure doesn't feel like the most wonderful time of the year. Because of what's happening around us. Because of what we're going through. Because of what this year has brought us. Because of what this year has caused in our lives. And, 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 and so even at times like this where we're, we're supposed to be celebrating, oftentimes in those, in those moments it gets even exaggerated. Our issues, our, 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 our problems, our dilemmas, what we're feeling, they get blown up. And we realize, man, there's so much that's out of control. There's so much that's happening right now that it feels like it's robbing me of life. We realize in times like this, man, there's just, there's people I can't control. There's problems I can't solve. And if you're like me, you get honest, you look into the mirror, you know what you find? You find you're the problem you can't solve. We, we, we think it's all about people and, and their expectations not being met, but yet we have so many that we hold up that aren't being met either. And this time of year, man, it can just exaggerate this feeling of all that we aren't or that we can't or that we don't. So, so at Christmas, really is the most wonderful time of the year, but it's not necessarily the most wonderful time of the year because of what is happening here. here here's what I wrote down. What makes Christmas time so wonderful is not necessarily what is happening. Because if, if you just looked at what's happening, you would have to go, I don't know that I would say that this is the most wonderful time of the year, that this is the most wonderful time of, of, of my life. What makes Christmas time so wonderful is not necessarily what is happening, but what happened. That God sent his son that light stepped in to darkness. You see, at Easter, we celebrate an event, the resurrection. But at Christmas, we call it a season. We, we, we celebrate an event that happened that changed everything, where God sent his son to become the center of history, and even more importantly, to us to be the center of my life, the center of your life, that when we base our whole life on him, when he is the center of our life, it centers us on something stable and something that we can trust in and something that we can hold on to. It gives us a sense of purpose. It, it brings life to us, to where we can have to say, even though there's a lot of things to be afraid of, I don't have to fear when Jesus becomes the center of your life, brings life to us. I need to be reminded of that. You need to be reminded of that. That we need Christmas. But here's the deal we don't need Christmas just in the Christmas season. We need to be reminded of it every day of our lives. And that's why, man, as, as I was approaching the, to talk uh, uh, through this month, I was so excited to talk about this because, man, this year more than any, I need Christmas. I need to remember that God is with me. 
that he has promised to never leave me, to never forsake me. And the dark, the darker things get, the more complicated things get. And every, everything that seems to get a little more exaggerated. But even in this time, we're able to pause for a moment and focus on the light of the world that has come to make an unbelievably practical difference in your life and in my life. Now, if you're familiar with the Christmas story, you know we usually read out of Matthew and Luke. As a matter of fact, maybe you know this. There's four Gospels in the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the stories, the account of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, very similar in the way that they recount Jesus here on earth. I'm walking with them. John's a little bit different. And John, unlike the other three, doesn't give a birth announcement like in Matthew and Luke especially, doesn't talk about the birth of Jesus in the same way. John kind of gives us a, a different perspective. The thing that's so fascinating about the Gospel of John, and it's easy to miss because sometimes we think of the Bible as just stories. It's not just stories, it, it's history. It's people that have walked with Jesus, people that were there, that this is, this is part of their life as they journey through this thing that makes John's gospel so unique is, is, is it's thought when he wrote his gospel, he was a very old man. So, 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 so this was reflecting back. As a matter of fact, a lot of scholars think it's the last gospel that was written. And so when John sat down to write this, and we don't know this for sure, but if it was like us, he's probably thinking, I better write some of this down because I might not be around much longer. And, and I want people to know. I, I want people to read the stories. I want people to know what I've experienced. I want people to know about Jesus. I want to write this down for future generations so, so that through this book, they can experience the person who changed my life. There's no, no doubt. You can read through Acts. John had stories, and John told the stories many, many times. Can, can you imagine if you knew someone that had sat at the feet of Jesus? Like every time they showed up, wouldn't you be like, okay, you got to tell me more. Okay, you got you to let me know what's happening. And tell me, tell me that story again, because I really like that one, right? I mean, we would have wanted to hear this over and over and over. So he told these stories many times. John's the person, you find, find this amazing, that he, and, and I don't want this to sound trite, but he, he condensed God, he simplified God into one word. And when, when, when he's looking back over his life and he says, you know, if, if I was just to let you know one thing I know for sure, one thing about God that you can hold on to, here, here's the way he says it. John chapter four, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because, and here it is, God is love. Said, if, I, if I could tell you one thing that I know, looking back on my whole life as an old person, I can tell you this. There's a lot of things I didn't understand. We're gonna see in just a minute, we're gonna talk about it a little bit. There's a lot of dark days. But I know this for sure. God is love. And then he shows us how that love was demonstrated. As a matter of fact, in, in a way, this is the Christmas story. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins the thing that makes this so amazing when you stop to think about it, you gotta know what John experienced in his life. Because it's easy for us, right? Even, even if we just took this year, not, not all the other things that have piled up, not all the other things that have been through, but if you just took 2020 and go, yeah, not so sure God is love. With all that we've been through, with all that's going on, and John says, my whole life, what I've come to know, what I've come to find out, what I've come to believe, God is love. He's, he's an old man right in this. He'd ex he's experienced loss like you can never believe. I mean, you think you got a story, I'm telling you. Nobody's got a story of walking through dark days like John. He's lost friends. He's lost family members. In some ways, he's lost his whole society, the whole culture 
that he knew. He's isolated. They tried to take his life. He, he was alive when, when, when Nero sent General Vespasian into Galilee to, 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 to overthrow and to destroy all of the Jews. And he watched as cities after city were destroyed. It's thousands and thousands of people were taken into slavery. It had to be people that he knew. John lived through that slaughtering of millions. John lived through the time when Vespasian left his son to surround Jerusalem. Now, we don't know. Maybe he was in Jerusalem, the city that he loved, where he had so many incredible experiences with Jesus. Maybe, maybe he was outside the city and just heard about that. We don't know. But, but he was alive during the time, and there was plagues, and there was starvation, and people were dying, and people were giving up all hope. The end of the Jewish War, 1770 AD, John was either there or heard the story about the temple being burnt to the ground. Over a million Jews slaughtered. Some people think 200, 300,000 of them taken from the city and sold into slavery. By the time he wrote this gospel, friends that he had done ministry with, that he had walked with the apostle Peter, the apostle Paul. They had been put to death by Nero and through all of that bloodshed and all of that loss and all of that chaos that we can't even begin to imagine. He never lost his faith. In fact, at the end of his gospel, he writes this. He says this. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. So he's letting us know, he said, I, I didn't have enough space to write all of this down. I, I mean, you want stories? I got stories. There's so much more. I didn't even have the opportunity to tell you in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Not, 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 not a physical life, because everybody reading this would have been alive. But John believed there was something more to our existence here. There's something greater that could see you through what you think is the greatest darkness that you have ever faced. He said, I, I, I'm writing this because I'm hoping that you won't just read it and be amazed. You won't just read it and go, wow, that something inside of you would say, I, I want that. I need that that, that, that. that something inside of you would believe there's an opportunity for me to have life that goes beyond just existing. And I want that. John believed Jesus was the source of life that went way beyond physical life. So, so when he begins, he, he doesn't begin with a birth narrative. And if anybody could have probably written a great birth narrative, it would have been John. Right? You remember when Jesus is crucified, Jesus looks down from the cross, and John and his mother Mary were there, and he says, you know, John, this is your mother. Mary, this is your son. Take care of each other was basically what he's saying. History tells us that, that Mary stayed with John until she died. Can you imagine how many times John would have had the opportunity to ask her about that moment? What was it like? How scared were you when the angels showed up? What happened? Tell me. About it. He would have had the opportunity to hear that over and over and over. But when he starts his gospel, he doesn't start with mangers and, and angels. He doesn't start with a journey. He begins with the significance of the birth of Jesus. Just like there were very, very dark days in the life of John, he, he knew there were very dark days. Jesus was born in a very dark time in history. When he sat down to Start his gospel before he got into the accounts, before he got into there, all the details. Here's what he says. And listen, this is extremely important for us to get a hold of this because in times in our lives and in seasons when it can get so complicated, when, when we struggle and the world around us seems dark and it feels like it's closing in and we've suffered through things and, and, and loss and isolation and fear and depression, John begins his gospel with the birth of Jesus in this way. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And he makes this statement, verse four, in him was life. Remember, old man, looking back, all that he lost, all that he'd been through. 
came to find in him. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. Now, now, now what makes this so powerful is, is, is back then, when, when, when they would have kind of finally recognized that Jesus was who he said he was, that Jesus was the Messiah, all the thought then was that he was gonna raise up, right, the, the Jewish people to overthrow Rome and they were gonna set up their kingdom and the empire, that, that he was a Jewish Messiah, that it was their time. Even after Jesus is resurrected from the dead, they're meeting with him, they're going, okay, is now the time? Are we ready? And Jesus basically says, man, listen, don't miss this. It's so much bigger. That, that is such a small part. That's not for us to talk about right now. He says, what you need to understand is what I've come to do is to be the life for everyone, for all mankind. You're to take this message that I have life for them to every people group, to every ethnic group, to, to all around the world, right? Here's what he says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And John goes, huh. he wasn't just the Jewish Messiah. He, he's the light to the whole world. He can bring life to anyone and everyone who believes. And jump, jump, jump back, verse five. The light shines in the darkness. So, 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 so he had just said he's the light of all mankind. Verse five, he says, the light shines in the darkness. And I have to think he thought about the darkness that he'd experienced in his life. Darkness that, while it's different than ours, maybe, maybe we understand a little bit of that. We've sensed that we felt we experience darkness that often feels like it's growing around us. He says, in spite of everything that happened, everyone who's died, everyone who was executed, everyone who was crucified, everyone who was taken away, in spite of the fact that the whole Jewish culture is being tried, trying to be wiped out, that the whole temple structure is gone, in spite of everything, everyone that I know is gone, in spite of all of that, the light shines in the darkness. And he goes on and he says, and the darkness has not, now, with, with, with what I do for a living, I get a chance to think a lot and write a lot, and you begin to put words down. And, and so, so, so in my mind, here's what I'm thinking. Maybe John wrote this, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not, and maybe he paused right there. Okay, how, how can I say this? Because this light stepped into my life, and my life's been dark. But this light comes in. To the darkness. As light stepped into the dark world and it's been dark. But I, how, how can I say this about Jesus, about the light? You see, because everyone knows when, when you light up in the darkness, it reveals what's in the darkness. We all know that. And, and John, I believe, is thinking, man, there, there's so much more. This light of Christ, this light of Jesus, it shines in the darkness and it's as if, not that he just brought light to the darkness, but it's as if the darkness keeps trying to put out the light. That the darkness keeps trying to seize it, to snuff it out, to overwhelm it. It seems the world and our culture constantly tries to blow the light out. And so John is saying, wait, what can I say? The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. It's a guy who suffered unbelievable loss. Been through dark times. His friends put to death because of what they believed. And maybe he wrote with a grin on his face, I don't know. But he's looking back over his whole life. In spite of everything this world has tried to do to eradicate that light, to snuff out the message, the darkness has not overcome it. Caesar couldn't do it. Nero couldn't do it. Tiberius couldn't do it. It has not put it out. Culture couldn't do it. The world couldn't do it. Destruction of the temple couldn't do it. Even putting Jesus on a cross could not overcome that light. There's nothing that could blow that light out. Right? Remember, John raced to the tomb when he heard Jesus was risen. He wouldn't quite go in yet, but eventually he peeks in to see Jesus really Risen from the dead. He has, he, has, he has a meal with Jesus after the resurrection. This was John that was absolutely convinced that no matter what happens in life, 
No, no, no matter what we face, no matter how deep the heartache, no matter how extreme the fear, no matter how deep the depression, there is a light that shines in the darkness and there is no amount of darkness. There is no type of darkness. There is no form, no kind, no category of darkness that can put it out. That's why we need Christmas. We need to remember There is no darkness that can overcome the light. I don't know what you may be feeling right now. Maybe you're walking through this going, yeah, but Michael, you don't know. I'm just telling you, you need Christmas. You need to remember the light that stepped into the world and the darkness cannot overcome it. When we're confronted with the fact that there are people that that, that, that we can't make a breakthrough with, that we can't control. There's expectations we'll never meet. There's loss, there's fear. There's so many things going on as 2020 has thrown things our way that we never dreamed of as darkness seems to grow around us. We're reminded in the midst of that darkness that Jesus is life and the light who overcomes the darkness. There is always hope. There is always a reason to believe. There is a God who hears your prayers. There's a reason to wake up every day and take the next step. I see back where we started. What makes Christmas time so wonderful is not necessarily what's happening. Because there's a lot of people that probably just want to cancel Christmas this year, right? You know, like 2020 is not the year to have Christmas. Because if it couldn't go wrong, it's going to go wrong. If there's a year to leave it out, it's this year. But it's not about what's happening. It's about what happened. The Heavenly Father loved you so much that he sent his one and only son. That that light that shines in the darkness, that light can shine in your life and give you life because... In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Not then. John's saying, I'm at the end of my life, and I gotta tell you, there's been some dark days, but no matter how great the darkness, it could not overcome the light. Not now. Here we are, closing out 2020, thank God. (laughs) And you know what? The light's still shining. Doesn't matter what you're facing. Doesn't matter how dark it feels. Can't overcome the light. Not then, not now, not ever. Doesn't matter what the world throws your way, I'm telling you. We need Christmas. Some encourage as I close. Over the next few weeks, would you let the light of Christ bring you life? Would would you set aside some time, and, and, and this is a big challenge, every day, to thank God for Jesus. To say, God, now more than ever, I need Christmas. I need to remember how real you are, that you are with me, that you are for me. The darkness cannot, will not win. And here's one more. This is fun, and I think you'll remember this one. Every time you see a tree with a light on it, every time you drive by a house, someone's taken some time to to put up some decorations, to hang some lights. Every time you see one of those little light bulbs twinkle, Would you let it remind you darkness will not win? That light has stepped into the world. And would you just say, God, thank you. Thank you for the light. Thank you for sending your son. Jesus, thank you that you change everything. You bow your heads with me. God, I just pray right now, all of us, wherever we are.
God, in, in my role, I get to hear so much of what people are going through. And there's some darkness. It feels like it's winning. God, we need Christmas. Would you remind us that when you stepped into the world, you came to give us life? That when that light came, there is no amount of darkness that can overcome it. And Father, I pray for me, for those of us gathered. Would you remind us that in you we find life? Would you renew our hope? Renew our courage? Strengthen our faith? Help us to trust you with everything and to know that no matter what we face, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love you have for us that was shown in Jesus Christ. Speak to our hearts now as we worship you. Remind us of who you are, of how much you love us, the life that you have for us. God, I pray. How many every years you give us, I want to be able, like John, at the end of my life to look back and say, I know this. God is love. And in him, I found life. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our worship team is gonna come and lead us in just a few moments of worship. Here in the building, if you will, will you go ahead and stand with me? Those of you joining us there, would you just take these few moments and let God speak to your heart, remind you of that light, remind you of how much he loves you. Let's worship together today.